There you go. Yeah. So what I'd like to do, first of all, is, as most of you are acutely aware, with the uh, crisis we're facing, is that the classroom attendance has been cancelled. So to some degree, we'll have to carry on the lectures uh, via this means. What I'd like to do today, I'll do two short videos, about 15 minutes each. The first, I want to look at the emergence uh, as a follow-up to the lecture I did in our last class about the three wings of the Enlightenment, the right wing of the Enlightenment with its emphasis on science, rationalism, empiricism, what we would call the rationalist wing of the Enlightenment. The reaction to that was the romantic wing of the Enlightenment, which highlighted uh, intuition, imagination, a much more communal sense, uh, organic sense of past and present. Uh, and then both sides had their weaknesses and limitations. So the humanist wing of the Enlightenment tried to synthesize some of the best of the Romantic while recognizing its aberrations, and then the best of the Romantic while recognizing its Achilles heel. I finished with the Canadian context of Charles Taylor, who has been seen in continues to be seen as one of the most significant Hegelian philosophers alive today, even though he's in his late autumn years. What I want to do in the next few minutes is then uh, look at the rise of uh, an emergence of a certain type of liberalism, particularly with its emphasis on individuality, uh, the market, uh, lighter state, lighter taxes, and some of the key thinkers that articulate that. Uh, these were seen as liberals in their time, the 17th, 18th centuries. Um, but when we hear the word conservative today in the Canadian context or republicanism in the American context, for those who think politically and are a little more sophisticated in terms of ideology and politics, these are the wells they go to intellectually to dip their buckets. And uh, hence, important to know that. I'll also look at that, and then I'll, people like Adam Smith, Edmund Burke, uh, David Hume, uh, and then move forward to Hegel, and how Hegel plays a very significant role in this process, and finish with the left wing of the uh, Enlightenment, particularly the economic question through Karl Marx, because Marx is very important. Obviously, his thinking has shaped dominant aspects of the world. Uh, that Cold War was a uh, high point of Marxist thinking, but there remain many revisionist Marxists today. And some of the culture wars we um, are acutely aware of talk a lot about cultural Marxism, and out of this comes the social justice warriors. So important to understand uh, there's a history to all of this, and they're important thinkers, and that we are all the heirs and recipients of what has gone before, even though we may thin out that in some way. So let me begin. And again, this is going to be a stone skimming the surface of the water overview, but important that you understand uh, these things. Um, as I have touched on lately, uh, John Locke, a very important English thinker following on Thomas Hobbes, is uh, chronologically uh, and different in very important ways, particularly Second Treaties of Government is very different from Leviathan. But grappling with what, what constitutes the good life, how do we keep order, predictability? Locke was very concerned following from the Puritan Revolution, uh, peace, security, uh, the importance of the individual being protected, uh, a great suspicion of ideology, and of course the violence that can emerge from ideology. So John Locke, um, his second treatise of government, well, for his first treatise, he deals with the end of the aristocracy, uh, and he's trying to articulate in the second treatise a way of moving forward in which individuals are prioritized. Uh, the state has its role, but it's a contractual relationship. Uh, and out of out of uh, Locke's thinking, you get increasingly so the the entrepreneurial individual or just the individual itself. Uh, using their liberty as they see fit, all being equal, to bring into being what they perceive, and this can be defined differently, the good, the meaningful, the happy, the happy life. Underneath this is, of course, the economic question, because as uh, time moves on and religion becomes somewhat dim, the new religion becomes economics, and he or she who 
uh, is the most successful entrepreneur, is the one who becomes a shaper and maker of society. So as Locke's thinking moves from from uh, England over to the United States, Locke is a key figure in all of this, in the founding of the United States, and its emphasis on a lighter state, the importance of the individual, the contractual relationship, and so uh, now, Locke is most people's, and then Adam Smith, of course, who uh, is significant to this with his Wealth of Nations and some of his other works. Uh, Adam Smith is often read out of context in a way that he seems to be an apologist for the market economy, uh, the state uh, staying as far as possible from the market, laissez-faire economics, and uh, the right wing has really picked up on Adam Smith, his Wealth of Nations. Now, Smith was a much more subtle thinker uh, in this regards than is often attributed to him. Uh, but he certainly, within his what's called a physiocratic approach to economics, uh, held high the role of the state being separate from the market and the market and the entrepreneurs, the captains of industry were the best equipped and skilled uh, to create the greatest amount of profit, which would create the greatest amount of wealth within a society. Locke and Smith then share this emphasis in different ways uh, in terms of the emerging entrepreneurial individual in their role. Now, sometimes Locke is seen as a key figure of emerging uh, uh, liberalism, and Edmund Burke uh, is seen by the many as a bastion of conservatism. So, for example, if you're in the United States or thoughtful people in Canada or the UK or elsewhere. Edmund Burke is seen as the great defender of conservatism, of tradition, of history, of the of, of culture, of literature, somewhat the way Roger Scruton would be today, who just died a couple of months ago. And so, so Smith and Locke are often pitted against uh, Edmund Burke. But the fact is Edmund Burke was very good friends with, with Smith. And uh, they, both, they both held to the position of, for example, the American Revolution. They were great supporters of the American Revolution, even though Burke would have been very suspicious of the French Revolution because of its secularism. It's turning against religion. It's turning against the past, bringing into being something totally new, whereas Burke thought you had to build on the past, and the past had wisdom and insight that you could not turn against, or there'd be serious implications culturally, politically, economically, religiously. Um, so Burke was much more grounded explicitly in the past. Uh, Locke and Smith would give a nod to it, but they were not as grounded. So Burke is often seen as a great defender of conservatism, uh, whereas Locke and um, Smith not quite as much so, but they all shared above all else this uh, centrality of the market economy, the rights of the competitive individual to compete, um, the notion that the state at inappropriate times could intervene, but would be should be hesitant in doing so. So you get the rise very much of what we see in the West as capitalism, the market economy as foundational. Um, to building up a sane, a civilized, a cultured world. And so when we hear the word conservative today, um, in different ways, conservatives say in Canada, in the United, uh, Republicans in the United States or in the UK or elsewhere, they're conserving the work of uh, Smith, um, Burke, Locke, I might mention David Hume in this regard also, um, and so important to understand this, that these uh, conservative traditions, they're not conserving something that uh, predated people like uh, the market economy and Locke and Smith and Burke and Hume and people like that. They're arguing this is really the beginning of the West as we know it, a bringing into being through the use of liberty and choice and competition, uh, a new world. And in that sense, the United States was the embodiment of that. In Europe and England, there were checks and breaks on that because they came from an older history. Within, the, within North America, something is new is coming into being and um, uh, foundational to that is the open-ended nature of history, of human choice, of human being, of human creating 
Now, a figure that builds on some of this, which is very important, is Hegel, which I've touched on briefly in the class. Now, Hegel, underneath Hegel's thinking was the notion of the dialectic. There was a thesis, there was an antithesis, and then a new synthesis. And history was an ongoing dialectic uh, in terms of, for Hegel anyway, the consciousness of liberty. And now he does, a, a, Hegel as a philosopher, does this massive overview of the history of humankind, the, the Greek, the Roman civilization, how this um, unfolding goes from the ancient Greeks to the Romans, to early Christianity, to Protestantism. But he also draws on ancient civilizations such as India and China. And so it's this epic dialectic of the, the nature of history, particularly the understanding of freedom and liberty and the consciousness of that. So Hegel, Hegel is a great a German philosopher that one and all to know should know because he's certainly um, uh, standing on the shoulders of those who have gone before him uh, in terms of his understanding of the consciousness of liberty. And he saw in his time the best embodiment of civilizations, his time. Now, two, two things to bring together this, and I'll just wind down this particular uh, video, is that Karl Marx, who I, I briefly talked about the Enlightenment, uh, the last uh, lecture we had in, in class, the left wing of the Enlightenment is was very, very much one, particularly the elements of the high romantics or high Tories, which was uh, focused on the importance of the relationship of the past to the present, of individuals to community. Uh, Hegel tended to focus more on philosophic ideas. Marx was much more interested, what do ideas look like when embodied in the economic sphere of life? And so in his dialectic, as I said, there was a th uh, thesis, antithesis, synthesis. Now what he does to just update it quickly for you on the economic level, Often people see Marx and Adam Smith as being an anti antithetical, Smith being the great thinker of the market economy as interpreted in a certain way, the same with Locke and Hume and Burke in different ways. Um, but Hegel took the position, uh, he was deeply indebted to Smith in, in terms of the entrepreneurial class and the capitalist class and the role for him of the bourgeois class, which in its economic ability could up the economic level, bring prosperity and wealth. But the, the difficult thing, as Marx articulated, this was done on the backs of the proletariat. So if you can see the thesis, as Marx interprets Hegel in his dialect, the thesis is that you need a market economy, you need entrepreneurs, you need wealth, you need the active of people who are the, uh, the captains of industry, the shakers and makers of time to elevate the economic sphere. This is the thesis, and Marx, so Marx was not initially against the market economy as understood in a certain way, but at a certain point, the uh, antithesis to that is, who are the slaves uh, of this prosperity, of this wealth? Well, it was the working class, it was the laboring class, it was for Marx, the, uh, the proletariat. So the antithesis was at a certain point in Hegel's dialectic as understood in an economic way, the proletariat would rebel against the landowning class, the, the captains of industry, the CEOs of corporations, uh, and they would take over the means of production, of which the state would play a very, very significant role in that, in, in that way. And the, the bourgeois class then uh, would find its place uh, not so much as the leader, the aristocrats of wealth and banking and all of this, but in fact, the proletariat would overthrow them. There would be a vanguard class, which would be at the forefront of this, uh, and which would be part of the antithesis, the leadership at a material level and the dialectic at an intellectual level. Uh, the, the overturning uh, of the wealthy by the proletariat the vanguard class would be the material means of embodying that dialectic or the Weltgeist, the spirit of the time. Uh, and then this final synthesis finally would be, of course, the withering away of the state and the classless society would emerge. And so in conclusion uh, of this, I'd just like to say is that uh, often Smith is seen, Adam Smith and those who are often seen as the harbingers of um, what's called conservative today is they were really just second generation liberalism is often seen at odds or the opposite of Karl Marx or various forms of socialism or communism as it was worked out in the former USSR.
and other socialist experiments around around the world and they're often seen as one against the other when in fact smith as marx understood via hegel's dialectic saw the entrepreneur the business person uh, as absolutely essential as absolutely essential uh, to the developing a vibrant economy an animated economy in which was their wealth but who is the ones who prospered that was the bourgeois and the proletariat would overthrow them and so the notion that that uh, marx and smith are at odds is that as i as i mentioned is marx sees smith as a part of the dialect of the thesis which would be opposed finally by the a proletariat and then out of this the class the society utopian notion in a sense will emerge and of course lenin and stalin and and other mao and others parts of the world they tried to take that dialectic uh, and embody that and of course we've seen the tragedies and the horror of some of those in elements of eastern europe and other parts of the world so to end this one then marx and smith important to understand they're not either or um, but in fact, Marx drew from Hegel's dialectic, um, dipped his bucket in people like Smith and pointed out that the left wing of the Enlightenment in that sense uh, uh, would best be initiated by the entrepreneurial class, but finally concluded through the proletariat, the vanguard, and then the classless society uh, would emerge. And of course, many um, um, theoretical Marxists argued the USSR and other places never had that economic foundation from which then to take the next step in the Marxist dialectic and hence they will argue many what are called Marxist societies really are not Marxist at all but they're a, a, a distortion a deviation from the Marxist ideal and so I'll end this uh, presentation at this point. <laughs>